As you can see today, we have come to Matthew, the 15th chapter. Matthew, the 15th chapter. Today, we will be looking at verses 29 through 39. 29 through 39. Amen. And I'm going to read all of those verses for you. Amen. 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 It is our custom to stand for the reading of God's holy word. Amen. If you are able to stand, please do. And this is what the word of God says. Matthew 15, 29 through 39. Jesus left there and went along the Sea of Galilee. Then he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Crowd, great crowds came to him, bringing the lame and the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet, and he healed them. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled made well, and the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they praised the God of Israel. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry or they may collapse on the way. His disciples answered, where could we get bread, enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? How many loaves do you have, Jesus asked. Seven, they replied, and a few small fish. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves and the fish. And when he had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples. And they in turn to the people. They all ate and were satisfied after the disciples picked up afterwards the disciples picked up seven baskets of broken pieces that were left over the number of those who ate were 4000 men besides women and children after Jesus had sent the crowd away he got into the boat and went to the vicinity of Magadan amen amen Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. We're going to speak on this subject today. The power of Jesus. The power of Jesus. Now I know that this passage sounds very familiar. But it is not the same passage as Jesus feeding the 5,000. There are many skeptics who believe that the Bible just continues to repeat itself and tell stories in a different way. These are two separate incidents. Jesus did feed 5,000 in chapter 14. This is chapter 15. Jesus comes and he feeds 4,000. But as we have been going through Matthew, the 15th chapter, this is what we have encountered. Matthew 15 started out verses 1 through 20. When the Pharisees came and confronted Jesus, they came and confronted Jesus and said, Hey, your disciples are eating food and they didn't even wash their hands. And so Jesus told them, your problem is you are choosing tradition of your forefathers, but you nullify the word of God. So they choose tradition over truth. Tradition is not the way of God. It is the true word of God, which, is, which we should honor. But they honored tradition rather than truth. So they came and confronted Jesus, and Jesus condemned them for their lifestyle of living for the world and not living for God. Then last week, verses 21 through 28, a Canaanite Gentile woman comes to Jesus and asks him to heal her sick daughter. Her daughter was demon possessed and Jesus told her, listen, I came to the Jews first. Let me feed the Jews and then 
the Gentiles can have bread from the, from the father's table. But she told him, listen, even the dogs under the table receive crumbs that fall from the table. And she had the kind of faith that moved Jesus and Jesus healed her daughter and she was healed that instant. Those two cases. Jesus went to his own people, the Jews, and the Jewish leaders, the officials, rejected Jesus because the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the rulers of those days, the, 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 the priests, uh, in other words, those who were over their holiness, supposed to be teaching them the word of God, was mistreating Jesus, who is the word of God. And so they rejected him. And then he comes to Gentile territory. This was supposed to have been a secret trip between him and his disciples. But his fame and popularity had, had grown so great that when he came, this woman said she knew who he was. And she wanted her daughter to be healed. Amen. His own people rejected him. The Gentile people accepted him. And he told this woman... You have great faith. He hadn't seen that kind of faith in all of his own people back in his own homeland. No Jew had the faith that this Gentile woman had. Jesus now is in an area what they call Decapolis. It means ten cities. And there are ten Gentile cities. And these people have come to Jesus because they've heard the stories of his great power. They understand that he has power and they believe that this power has come from God. And so Jesus is in a place where he's known that he's never even been before. And his popularity is even greater than in his own hometown. And his hometown people they don't want him. They have pushed him away. But there's people outside of the family who love him and respect him. And Jesus is going to display his power for these people, even though they don't even belong to the covenant of God. And so you got to understand that God's word and God's salvation don't just belong to a certain group of people, but it belongs to all who trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. All who believe that he is the Messiah. And so he has this kind of power. And for those who have been in Bible study over the last seven or eight months, we understand that Jesus is omnipotent. That means that he holds all power in his hands. We understand that Jesus is not just a great preacher or teacher or prophet, but Jesus is God. He says, when you see the Father, you see me. We are one. Yes, sir. The disciples asked Jesus, just show us the Father and we'll understand. And Jesus said, I've been with you this whole time. Don't you know me by now? In other words, I am the Father. Me and the Father are one. Yes, sir. So Jesus has all the power that God possesses because Jesus is God. Amen. And so I've divided this chapter into two pieces two parts. Here's the first thing that we're going to see is we're going to see that Jesus has the power to heal the handicapped. Jesus has the power to heal those who are handicapped. And, and, and look, this is the definition of handicap. It's a physical or mental disability making participation in an activity or daily living more difficult. Here's another definition. Any disadvantage that makes success more difficult. These people had a disadvantage. These people were looked on as outcasts. These people could not participate in many things. But when Jesus got that, they began to bring all of the crippled, the blind, the lame, the mute. And guess what they've done? They laid them at Jesus' feet. Yes, sir. 
I, I find this very amazing. That they would know that Jesus is the Messiah of God. That, that he is the one that everybody's been talking about. He is the one that has all the power to heal. He is the one that has all the power to create. He has power to raise the dead. Jesus Christ is powerful. They came and laid it at Jesus' feet. And the text says that he healed them. He healed them all. So much that the people were amazed that they began to worship the God of Israel. These aren't Israelites. Jesus is in a foreign land because he wanted to get away and spend time with his disciples. But when he got there, they loved him and recognized him as the Messiah, the anointed one, more than his own people. And he healed them all. They came. They laid it. Lay those folks at Jesus' feet. And I would like to say this too. If you have a disadvantage. Yes. If you have something that's handicapping you. It may not be a physical problem. It may not be an illness. You may have a drug issue or a drinking issue or a lying tongue. Or like folks in my family, they got a street life problem. Listen, I ask you today, lay it at the feet of Jesus. And he will heal you from whatever it is. Whatever your problem is. Whatever your issue is. Whatever heartache, whatever mistakes you have made. Lay it at Jesus' feet and he will remove it from you. So now you will no longer have a, a disadvantage. But now you have an advantage because he's taken away whatever it is that's making you, keeping you from being successful in the life of God that God has for you. Just lay it at his feet and let him use it and let him get rid of it so that he can use you in a mighty way. These people trusted Jesus this much to lay it at his feet and Jesus healed them all. Healed them all. But in Mark the seventh chapter, this is another account of Jesus in the Decapolis healing people. And I put this, it's the exact same account but Mark tells it from a different angle. Matthew says that he tells them about a healing of a lot of different kind of people. But Mark pulls out one guy specifically to point out how Jesus healed him. Mark 7 verse 31 says this. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down the Sea of Galilee, and into the region of Decapolis. Remember, ten cities. There are some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. He had a speech impediment. No one could make out his words. Look what it says. And they begged Jesus to place his hands on him. Now, 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 people who could not speak well, people who were dead, they thought that they had some type of psychological illness or, or a, a, a mental disability. They thought they were cursed by God. They thought that they were insane. And so they brought this man to Jesus and said, they begged Jesus, please heal him. The man couldn't hear. The man couldn't speak clear words. Maybe he babbled. And look what the text says. Verse 33. After he took him aside away from the crowd. Jesus took him away from the whole crowd. And then watch this. Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. You see that? Look, look. He put both fingers in his ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. You know what Jesus is doing? Jesus is using a form of sign language that the man couldn't understand. Jesus pulls the man aside and he lets him know, you're not damaged goods. You're not mentally 
un unstable. All you need is to be healed. So Jesus, speaking in a language that he can understand, Jesus goes, your ears, the man probably was getting, mm -hmm. your ears. And then look, Jesus spit or, or touched his own tongue and then touched the man's tongue like, you know, you can't talk. Touch the man's tongue. Like, now, now listen. Jesus put his own spit in the man's mouth. Now, now I, I, I don't like spit. But if anybody's going to spit in my mouth, I'm going to choose Jesus. Okay? Uh, look, his spit is holy. And, and, and he is God. So I, I will allow Jesus to do it. But somebody in the streets, we got a problem. Don't, don't spit on me, bro. We, we got a big, big problem. But Jesus... Put his own spit on the man's tongue. Now watch the next sign language. After he said, ears, yeah, yeah. You can't speak, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus does this. He says, heaven's going to heal you. You see, he, he's, he's looking up. Look what the text says. He put both fingers, his fingers in the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. Then he looked up to heaven. That's what he's saying. You need a healing from the Lord. That's what you need. You, you need heaven's power to be manifested in your life. And then Jesus took a deep sigh. The text says he just went. Whew. In other words, be calm. You need healing of ears. You need your tongue here. You need to speak. Heaven's going to do it. Whew. Be calm. And then look. He speaks the first word to the man, an Aramaic term, he says, Ephetha, which means be open. At this, the man's ears were open. Now, now watch this. He can hear. And his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. You see the power of Jesus? But this is the funny thing. I didn't put it on the outline. But in verse 36 of Mark uh, 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 chapter 7, this is what Jesus told the man. Uh, don't tell nobody. Hold on. But then it says that the man couldn't help it. He told everybody. Now, now, now Jesus, that's a little unfair to say don't talk when I've never talked clearly my whole life. Now, I'm always on Jesus' side, and I'm always with the right thing, but I, I'm, I'm the same way. Listen, if this was to happen to me, and I can't talk at all, and now, Jesus, you make me talk, guess what? I'm going to have the I can't help it. It's going to be like fire shut up in my bones. I'm going to run through the streets telling everybody what Jesus done. He, he just couldn't help it. He's like, like, you know what? Well, he told me not to tell nobody, but I've never spoken in clear sentences my whole life. Lord, I just can't help it. I'm sorry to be disobedient. I got to tell everybody, Jesus, what you've done for me. But Jesus already knew because Jesus is God. He's not only omnipotent, but he's omniscient. He knows everything about everybody and everything. Yes, sir. This is who Jesus is. Jesus heals this man speaks in a way that he can understand and tells him heaven is going to heal you. God is going to heal you. And he speaks a familiar term where the man can read his lips. And he loosed his tongue and the man began to tell everybody, what has God done for you that you can go out and tell everybody about the goodness of God? Or are you still handicapped? You so useless to God that you are refusing to tell anybody about the goodness of God. You don't tell God how he has blessed you. You don't tell folks how God has blessed you. You don't tell folks on your work. You don't even tell your children how good God is. If God has been good to you, you ought to tell everybody what God has done. This man told everybody about what Jesus has done. Jesus has the power to heal the handicap. Here's the next thing. The next part of this chapter is Jesus has the power to satisfy hunger. These people, 
the Bible says, this scripture says, they have been with Jesus for three days. This is how you know that these are different feedings. The 5,000 is different from the 4,000. During the 5,000, the text says that the people had been with Jesus for one day. This scripture says that they've been with Jesus for three days. That they're, they're totally different. And they're in different areas. One is in the land of Israel. The other one is outside on the other side of the Sea of Galilee in the Decapolis in a Gentile area. Remember, he had not come in and began to do great things for Gentiles because he said that I came to the lost sheep of Israel first. Yes, sir. Salvation comes from the Jews and then goes abroad. Salvation was for the Jews. He was supposed to come in and save the Jews. And as God's chosen people, they were supposed to go out and tell everybody else about the goodness of God. But they failed God with their rebellious lifestyles. Yes, so here Jesus is in Gentile territory, healing Gentile people. And the first time he healed 5,000, he fed 5,000 Jews. This time, he's going to feed 4,000 Gentiles. He has the power to satisfy their hunger. Verse 32, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I don't want them to leave and be hungry because they may go on their journey and collapse. They had come a long ways to see Jesus. But what I love about this passage is that Jesus didn't ask them if they was hungry. He already knew what they needed before they even asked. This is the kind of God that we serve. He already know what you need before you even ask. And sometimes he just takes it up on himself just to bless you. Now other times you need to come to God and you need to tell him, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Listen, but this time he already knew what they needed. They didn't ask him for food. They wasn't begging for food. They had been with him three days. That means that, that listen, they already ran out of their supplies. They may have brought enough food, but only for two days. This is the third day. And plus, they got a long journey home. He said, I have compassion for them. I, I, listen, I don't want to see these people go away and collapse. But he has the power to satisfy their hunger. Verse 33, the disciples asked, where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? You would think that after... Him feeding the 5,000, they'll be like, okay, Jesus, well, let, just do your thing. But they sitting here with doubt about how Jesus is going to do this. Don't you remember the 5,000, Peter? Don't you remember the 5,000, John and Andrew? Don't you remember how I done it then? But see, back then, it was a familiarity. They knew that Jews may be willing to share their lunch with other Jews. So they took the little boy's lunch with the few fish and the five loaves, right? And so this time they're like, we, we, don't even know where, we don't even know where the local market is. We're in a desert, desert place. We don't know where Walmart is. And this is a different country to us. We, we don't know how to get to the grocery store. This is different for us. And so Jesus asked them a question. Okay. How many loaves do you have? Seven, they replied. And a few small fish. This also lets you know how different these are. Because the other time, they, they didn't have seven loaves. They had five loaves and two fish. Now they have seven loaves and a few small fish. Possibly the size of sardines. Something real small. And guess what? Jesus is like, okay, let me have it. He told the crowd to sit on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves and the fish and he thanked God for them and he began to break them. 
and he gave them to the disciples. Then the disciples handed out to the people and they all ate and were satisfied. After the disciples, they picked up seven baskets full of broken pieces that were left over. If you remember the, the story of the 5,000, how many baskets were left? Twelve. Twelve representing the twelve tribes of Israel. They, Because he was feeding Israelites. He was feeding Jews. Now he only has seven. Seven is God's number of completion. And that means that God's gospel is complete to go all over the world. Not just to Jews but to Gentiles as well. So he fed them. And here's another difference in those passages. It says this. That they picked up seven baskets of broken pieces. The word basket here is the Greek word spiritus, which means large basket. It is the same type of basket. It speaks in, in, in Acts 9 about what they loaded Paul in and lowered him down over the wall to flee persecution. So these were large, huge baskets that you can fit a human in. Now, the, the, the basket in, in feeding the 5,000 is the Greek word kaphony, which means a small rope basket that is used to pack a lunch. They had 12 small the first time. This time, they have seven large baskets that you can put humans in. God done greater things and even more things in the Gentile country than he could do with his own people. Jesus, they picked up so much food. They had so much left over. And it says that they fed 4,000 men besides women and children. And then they got into a boat and they went across and went to the vicinity of Magdala or Magdalene. Listen, this is the land where Mary Magdalene is from. Jesus is traveling and he is going and showing his power and he's blessing many, many people because Jesus is the power of God. But this is how you also know that the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000 are different. Because as the disciples continue to travel, they realize in chapter 8 of Mark, they begin to talk amongst themselves. And this is what they say starting in verse 14, Mark 8 and 14. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread. So th this has been some months since the feeding of the 4,000 and the feeding of the 5,000. They're like, they're like months apart, like six months apart. So here they are still traveling. And they says, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. And Jesus says, be careful. Jesus warns them, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, it is because we had no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Are you, are your hearts hardened? This is what Jesus is saying to them. Why are y'all talking about bread? Because I said, watch out for the yeast. No, no. Yeast represents the sin. Once you put yeast in bread, it spreads out through it all. And so the yeast of the Pharisees, once they get into you, the, that sin will spread. Jesus is talking about sin. They're talking about bread. Jesus is telling them, you don't need no bread. Why are you talking about bread? In other words, you got me. Look at verse 18. Do you, do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember 
when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. Watch verse 20. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, do you see that these are different? Don't let people tell you that they're the same thing. The Bible's not just repeating stories. It's the, it's, they're, they're very different and in different areas. He says, then how many baskets of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? This is what they're not understanding is that Jesus is God. And maybe some of you don't understand this. Jesus is God. Jesus wasn't just breaking the fish and breaking the bread and multiplying it as some folks. Listen, this is a miracle of creation. Yeah. Jesus is creating bread. Jesus is creating fish. Yeah. Just like he created wine, they poured in water, he turned it into wine. Jesus, this is a miracle of creation. He's saying, why are you talking about bread? You don't need bread when you have me. I am the creator of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one goes to the Father except by me. If you need bread, I'll create it. Stop asking me about bread. Whatever you need, God has the power to create it. Jesus is saying, listen, I can create you bread. Whatever you need, I can provide it. Whatever ailment you have, I can heal it. Whatever you hunger after, I can come in and satisfy. Matthew 5 and 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Jesus said, I satisfy. This is what I do. Psalms 107 and 9, he satisfies those and, 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 and he fills the hunger with good things. He satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Whatever you want, whatever you need, whatever dissatisfaction that you have, Jesus Christ can satisfy. Here's the question, do you trust him? Is he your Lord? Is, your, is he your God? He can heal whatever is keeping you from being successful on the workplace. He can heal you from whatever's being keeping you from being successful in the house of God. If your ministry ain't moving, if something is wrong with you, you don't feel like God is blessing you, there's something that's keeping you handicapped. And you got to lay that sin at the feet of Jesus and watch him remove it so that he can bless your life. If you're hungry, come to Jesus and he will satisfy your hunger. Our problem is that we're hungry for the wrong things. We want money and prestige. If you are hungry for righteousness, then God will bless you. If you're hungry for holiness, come to Jesus. He will satisfy that hunger. But you have to hunger after the things of God. And when you are faithful over a few things, God will make you rule over many. Do you trust Jesus today as Lord, as King, as Savior? Is he your God? And if he's not, I want to extend an invitation to someone today. To give their life to Jesus Christ. Is there anyone today? Is there anyone today?